Okay, and let's start it here in in Skype. There we go. Well, brethren, greetings and happy Sabbath. It's very, uh, well, for us here, we've had a cold wave. So for the first time now, this morning now, it's almost, it's around noon. We're having finally some sun rays. And uh, thankfully, we survived. We survived. The nights particularly get cold in winter, especially in January, which is the worst month of all the months in Europe. Um, and um, I see that the week has been very productive everywhere, everywhere indeed, uh, because um, I hear very positive news, everything going on in Africa, big doors opening up in Africa, as we could see. Uh, we could see people being relieved from, at least in some way, from hunger. Uh, and I hope that in, in, in the months to come that we can do even more so possible we could we could use the land we have there to you know plant some organic stuff and and employ more people and and, and uh, somehow resolve their hunger issues and all of that at the same time uh, at the same time I've been talking to my friend from from China now for for, for, for a whole week now and we have been exchanging some uh, positive experiences from our past walk you know Gabriel Bilbao and I have known each other for years we 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 met in 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 El Salvador in Central America uh, how many well some, <laughs> some 20 I guess years ago it was 2000 and 2005 2006 we've been talking about the activities of the various churches of God and um, we simply touched upon the we touched upon the the, uh, the 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 fact that sadly there is so uh, little truth, and uh, it seems so little interest that show people showing the truth, at least in the West. You know, uh, those big churches of God, and you know, people on the Sabbath will be talking about subjects that are not really really relevant to the sabbath they just look like well people in hong kong there is one one group of believers in hong kong they just you know on the sabbath is if as if you come to a social gathering you know rather than a fellowship and all kinds of things and this is exactly what i've been emphasizing to you and to myself and to all hope of israel that we as a hope of israel we have to be providing the a good spiritual education for the people you know because brethren was the purpose of all of us coming only for the Sabbath services and making it a social club and social gathering rather than, you know, rather than learning the precious truths of the Bible, you know. Uh, I, one, one thing that, that, that my friend said which struck me was, he said, you see, nobody preaches an, a, a, anymore. Nobody preaches anymore about baptism. Nobody preaches about repentance. Nobody preaches about redemption, etc., etc. And that's really very disconcerting when you think about it but that's exactly what we have to be preaching as the hope of israel you know we have to be we are we're hope of israel so we do have to preach and educate people about the most the crucial uh subject of the bible which is the identity of israel not only that there is a modern house of israel today but of the fact that there are other people all over the place who have been scattering you know scattering and being part of the israel because Israel, as I, as I have said many times, Israel has scattered into all the nations, meaning Israel has scattered into all the races, meaning that the lost house of Israel is found everywhere. Um, that's number one. And number two, you know, what, what, what does it serve us to just keep the Sabbath and holidays and we just don't, if we don't, don't have the understanding of the basic, basic doctrines of the Bible? You know, and uh, I don't expect the lay members, as I said, I don't expect the lay members to... Um, to be, uh, could I please ask you, those of you who are there, could you please uh, switch off the camera? We don't need your camera. Thank you for your lovely face, but we don't need your camera. So just switch the camera off because it slows down the connection. Thank you. Um, so, what's the purpose if people don't know the basic Bible doctrines? You know, if they just live and they're not able to understand and they're not able to explain to themselves and to others, they're not able to explain, you know. What is the a uh, what is redemption? What is salvation? You know what is the true conversion, and so on and so on. So, what's the purpose of you know the whole the whole thing? What's the purpose of all of our Christian life if we just live like dummies? We're not being called to be dummies. We're called to be teachers in the world tomorrow. And um, last Sabbath, as you see, we 
covered a subject, brethren, that is so little understood. Uh, in the nominal Christianity, it's not understood at all. But I, I'm afraid even within the true Christianity, people don't get it. And we covered the subject about the resurrections in the Bible. And I bet many of you, if not all of you, or, 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 or majority of you, might not have known that indeed there are three resurrections in the Bible. Today, therefore, somehow, it's a logical now, logical thing that we just, if we cover the resurrections from the dead, that we talk today about the, what is death? You know, what is death from Bible perspective, brethren? Death is n enemy number one. Death is something that people fear more than anything else. Why do they fear death? Well, I've said it once at least. People fear death because humans were not created to die. Humans were created to live forever. And had they made the right choice in the Garden of Eden, that would have been the case. But since the choice was wrong, you know, through Adam, as it says in the Bible, came sin and with sin came death. And so with second Adam, meaning Jesus Christ, will come life, eternal life. But public enemy number one, that's how death can be described. And for truly, you know, it will slay us all at a time of its own choosing. But paradoxically, brethren, although we all know that we will die, very few exactly know what death is. And certainly death must be the least understood, although most relentless enemy of all humankind. Yet, it needs not to remain a mystery to those who will look into their Bibles to read and believe what God says. For God has not left us in ignorance about this important subject, just like he does not leave us in ignorance about the, all the other important subjects, you see. But it is the, it is the duty of the ministry, it is the duty of the church, to explain to lay members all of that. You know, I cannot expect lay members to be knowledgeable about all and every aspect of the of the history of the House of Israel, or I cannot expect lay members to understand by themselves, you know, if without proper instruction to understand, you know, about redemption, salvation, uh, repentance, baptism, and so on. That's what the church serves for. That's what is, that is the purpose, and should be the purpose of all of our Sabbath gatherings, you know, that we indeed are learning and have uh, spiritually nourishing messages, however short or, or long they might be, so that our benefit, so that lay members can benefit from that, and then based on what they read in the Bible, then being guided by you know about the context and 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 and, and, and the content and context of the of the events, personalities, and so on, that people can you know make proper dis uh, decision. <coughs> One of the greatest problems in the church always generally was very little knowledge and understanding of the Old Testament. Uh, Events, you know, Old Testament events and, and, and personalities keep quiet. All per, per, personal, you know, all test, uh, personalities, various events, various uh, occasions, various things are really not really that understood when it comes to the Bible. And uh, whether people cannot really make some, but well, sometimes people cannot make connections, but we live in a totally different world. You know, the world of the first century of our era. Uh, the world of Jesus Christ when he came to this world was completely different. It was a, you know, Judean society occupied by the Romans. You might remember that the first non-Jewish convert to Christianity was Cornelius, the Roman centurion. You know, so it was a different world with different customs. And some of the some of the sayings and parables there are really having to do with some of the customs and and ways of that time. But that's okay, you know. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot expect people born in the 20th century to understand all of that unless they are being instructed. So therefore, the church is here to illuminate, illuminate all that, uh, all the context and content of the Bible, and is there to instruct people in some basic understanding. So people then later, as they study the Bible, and as they, as they have their own noses in the Bible, so to speak, people can then make some, uh, draw some good conclusions out of it, and they could apply it in their lives. That's exactly what it is supposed to be. Now, the New Testament is somewhat, it's somewhat easier, because those are the epistles to the, to the local congregations, and each local congregation had its own, uh, you know, occasions, had its own various uh, circumstances to deal with. That's more or less, okay, well, while with the Old Testament, you know, 
you have a whole nation, nation of Israel, that was now being disobedient. And now, as a result of their disobedience, they were being scattered and they were being defeated. And they lost everything from their freedom to their, to their country. But however, the result of that was that they just scattered all over the place, you see. And the thing is, even that, even that we might say, is in a sense, uh, you can say is, uh, 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 is a, well, let's say hidden blessing. Because, you know, the, the prophecy about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob was that their descendants will be like the stars in heaven, like the sand on the seashore. Now, how can you have in such a small place like uh, like the Promised Land is? How can you have uh, that mm, that number of people? You cannot. You know, it can only happen if they scatter all over the world, scatter among the nations, and then in those vast expanses of 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 of, of Asia, Africa, Europe, etc., they can then you know they can just procreate and have that many that many uh, descendants. So you know, everything in the Bible makes sense. Sometimes it, it doesn't seem to make sense. Sometimes this nominal Christianity just um, has perverted the scriptures to the point that uh, uh, some things, when you look at their, re you know, their, their reasoning, make no sense. One of the greatest nonsensical teachings is that God was obviously, God made something wrong. You know, God was wrong. God was obviously crazy to give one set of laws in uh, you know in the old testament and then in the new testament to proclaim those same laws to proclaim them invalid and to pray, proclaim them harmful for people and to you know and to be and to be not beneficial for people in any any way shape or form you know so uh, that's how the normal christianity look as god they look at god as a schizophrenic when you think about it now of course we are the true church of god and we being one of the true church. I'm not saying we are the only, no, I'm saying we are. We are certainly the true church of God, or one of the true churches of God, or part of the church of God's spiritual organism, however you want to put it. We are here to uh, rectify, correct all those wrong understandings, all those misrepresentations, and everything, everything else uh, that has been twisted in the process. And one of those questions is, one of the questions that remain, certainly very much on the mind of people, minds of people, and, and, and the mind of every all of us, is indeed, what is death, you see? What is death? So it needs not remain a mystery. And since life, brethren, the basic doctrine would be about that. This. Since life, our life that we have, is a temporary, mortal, chemical process with man being made from the dust, remember, from, the, from physical elements, from the dust of the earth, Death is therefore a cessation of life, and one who is dead has no consciousness separate from his body and feels no pain nor pleasure, but is as if asleep. That's how the Bible describes death. And nonetheless, we all, however, as we have seen last Sabbath, we all will live again after death, after a passage of time, when resurrected back to life again. And that's, in summary, what the Bible speaks about death. What is death? So death is not the end of the story, if you wish. Death is just one phase, let's say, sleeping phase, phase in which humans are all asleep, and then they will just come back to life again. Uh, and we explained last Sabbath that the first resurrection is the, eter is the uh, resurrection to eternal life, so humans are going to have spiritual body, the same as Jesus Christ does have, and they're going to live eternally. Uh, the second resurrection is the resurrection to physical life. All humans who never had the opportunity to be, to be for salvation, they will come back in order to have a period of judgment, uh, or better would be said, period of judging, judging so that they could, you know, they could qualify for their eternal life. And the third the resurrection is for those that you, for those individuals who you cannot really fit into any of the, those two previous groups, because those are people who have committed the unpardonable sin. You can't put them in the first group because the first group is for for called, chosen, and faithful; those who have endured to the end. In the second resurrection come people who have never had the opportunity, never had their uh, minds open to salvation. And so, therefore, what can you do with those groups? You know, they, they rejected God and they, they made such a stupid, stupid, mis uh, stupid decision, you might say. And, of course, they want to be miserable. 
Now, to allow somebody to live forever and be miserable, God is not a God like that. So therefore, they're going to come up in the third resurrection. Their sentence will be read to them or pronounced against them. And then they'll be burned up in the lake of fire. So, um, what is death? Like we said, death is what the Bible says, a period of sleeping. Uh, it's like somebody's asleep, he feels or she feels no pain, no pleasure, nothing. Uh, has no thinking process, has nothing, no creative process, has no, you know, has no any existence. But the world, of course, teaches everything differently, as you can just well imagine. A world, a world is a chaos. It's a set of chaotic teachings out there. Because most professing Christians believe that at death, they do not really die. That is, they do not really cease to live in any form. They instead believe that at death, only the body dies and uh, the, the soul is then liberated to live on in heaven or hell, depending upon the moral merit of the former life. Then you have others who are not Christians. They believe in reincarnation, thinking that their soul, which is liberated at death, will be placed in a new body to live again, with this process occurring over and over and over. Scientists who believe evolution... So the evolutionists, they seem to recognize death for what it is, the total cessation of life, but they also err because they know nothing of the hope of the dead, <laughs> which is life after, again, after a resurrection. And even other, other beliefs about death exist, you know, but yes, surprisingly, these concepts are not from the Bible. Why should it surprise you? Well, it doesn't surprise us who have been reading the Bible for years, and studying the Bible for years, but those who are perhaps not familiar with the Bible to them, they would think that these concepts of, you know, uh, immortal soul would be something that we, grow, we have from the Bible. Certainly not. Certainly not. So, in all that confusion, and when we come, when we come to the subject of the immortal soul, brethren, keep always in mind that was the first lie that Satan presented to Eve in the Garden of Eden. The first very lie was, you will not, oh, don't worry, you and Adam will not die. Brutal lie. Of course, they did not die immediately after taking of the forbidden fruit. No, they died afterwards, but still they died. You know, had they chosen uh, the, the other tree, they would not have died. But Satan was very clever, you know. Oh, oh, oh hello, Eve. Uh, did, did, God say, uh, did God say that you should not eat... Of course, he knew exactly very well what God said, but, you know, he was just being, being, being sly and being, you know, trying to, to, to uh, deceive Eve, and he succeeded, of course. Oh, he said, don't touch of that. Oh, really? Oh, no, 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 you shall not die. Because she said, you know, God said, if we touch of that tree, we will, if we eat of that tree, we'll surely die. No, you will not die. No, you cannot die. You have an immortal soul, in other words, you know. No, you cannot die. You will not die. You cannot die. You are forever. But, you know, God is God is really unjust. He really knows if your eyes will be open, if you eat of this forbidden fruit, your eyes will be open and, and you will be like God. So, you, know, you know, you'll be all-knowing, all-wise, all. And you see, brethren, that's why people today, they involve themselves in all kinds of new age new age theories in all kinds of they, people today what they want they want to be gods without god you know that's the basically in in summary the new age theology uh, you know self-realization self-actualization self 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 but without god you know where do you have in their theology that you know there is god as a supreme being there's god you know who demands of you repentance and change or change of your life there's god you know that wants you uh, to live this this and the other there's god who forbids you to be involved in the pagan pagan practices and pagan customs speaking of paganism those of you who live in the other parts of the world will not be you will not be you will not be aware that today is another tonight is another pagan event in eastern part of the world because the eastern church is orthodox churches will keep what they call the orthodox new year tonight you know so you know paganism and it's very interesting how this paganism is all concentrating in winter you know december and january is absolutely amazing and um, uh, and then, of course, then in spring, then comes revolving around the Germanic spring uh, paganism. There comes the Easter and so on. So, uh, 
you know people just don't want to they don't, don't they don't want to change their wrong ways they don't want to acknowledge that god is right and not them they don't want to give up on what their ancestors have been have been teaching them and have been you know living and all of that and uh, and 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 uh, basically the end of the story humans are really all the time they're just the sources of their problems it's not god and uh, perhaps the main reason why people religious or not religious do not understand death is be because first of all they do not understand what life is <laughs> you see but the bible makes it plain as you know genesis chapter 2 verse 7 brethren genesis 2 7 the bible says and the lord god formed men of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul you see a living soul so if man is if he is dead if he dies then he is a dead soul <laughs> meaning that indeed there will be no immortal soul as as the first lie was presented to Eve and she believed it you see and ever since after Eve and Adam I said you know people just always trying to find some ways to some deeper higher uh, spiritualized knowledge you know they all just love you know they just love this oh, oh secret theory this 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 secret uh, secrets secrets and uh, uh, that they should be discovering you know so people just get involved in all kinds of occult practices they get involved in all kinds of uh, actually demonic pra demonic practices anyway in occult practices in searching searching things that are not really uh, uh, from the bible searching things that are just lies from satan because satan has done everything very well to uh, deceive the whole world by presenting all kinds of theories and things look to be they look logical they look nice they look attractive brother but it only it's only the look it's only the look because the uh, uh, by doing or by presenting all of those all of those lying doctrines, you know, uh, lie lies. It's sin, and the, the wage of sin is death. And by uh, luring people into all those various doctrines and stuff, those people just become like uh, they they come like in a vicious circle, you know, and they just go round round in that vicious circle. But they believe, nevertheless, they're deceived that they're free and that they're happy and that they're just uh, accomplished as individuals. And of course, the result of all of that is death, is death anyway, and being uh, and being also separated from God, alienated from God, because those things that people do and 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 uh, and their their whole their whole schools of those occult teachings, uh, those things that people do and practice and stuff can never bring them bring them into some deeper, higher spirituality. It just brings them deeper and higher into demonism and into being slaves to demons. That is why, that is why all the Christians must make sure that they are not into anything occult, that they are not into anything witchcraft, tarot, tarot cards, uh, palm readings, you you name it. Yeah, people would love to know the truth. Well, the truth, the main truth, the main events of the truth are outlined in the Bible, believe it or not. It's right there in the Bible. And it's being fulfilled even to this day, even in this day in our eyes. But people just don't want to look at the Bible because the Bible to them is just a boring, a boring, a, a boring antique book that bears no relevance to their modern lives. Oh, really? You know, you, you don't find, as I said, you don't find all the knowledge of this world in the Bible. Of course not, because then Bible would be like several volumes and, and it would take us the whole, all of our lives to be reading it and never finish it. You see, the Bible has the basis is the foundation of knowledge and if you notice uh, it's it's the foundation primarily of the moral is foundation uh, embodied in moral laws you know and then all those principles those foundations you in various aspects of your life you can you know you can you can uh, apply you know the bible speaks for example about the quarantine the bible speaks about the the, the cleanliness and that's enough. When you apply that in medicine, when you apply that in other aspects of your life, then it, bring, it brings certain benefits. 
the Bible didn't give us all the analysis of the rich minerals and, and the vitamins found in fruit and vegetables and all this. Because again, you know, the Bible is not, it's not a scientific book with every single aspect of knowledge being, being involved because brethren, it would be a huge book. But nevertheless, we do have all these scientific disciplines that explain all those various things. But, you know, in, in, in the Bible, what we find as the foundation of all of that is the, is the moral law. Is the moral law how we treat the creation, how we treat the animals, how we treat those plants, how we treat, because, you know, the Garden of Eden was given to Adam to tend it and to keep it. And so from that example, we then know what should we be doing with what God gave us to tend and keep, you know. And uh, 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 that's, that, that's the way to achieve true happiness. So like, unlike the world, when, where they abuse the animals, you know, we who just cherish these animals, we just have certain benefits to see how they're growing, how they're happy, how they, how they try to give us things, how they bring some good stuff for us and, and, and do good things to us. The animals don't have the same the same thing. They have they don't have the spirit of spirit in men, and then therefore they cannot plan and and and, and, and they cannot uh, produce uh, the way we do. They just live by instincts. They don't have the, the mind. But nevertheless, in the animals, if you keep them, you can just notice. You can just notice they've got some feelings. They they have their own ways to express their gratitude to us. They are they can be very happy. And they know how to express that happiness, and so on and so forth, brethren. But uh, you know, we don't have a whole encycl encyclopedia of, of 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 about animals in the Bible, except that they're mentioned in the Bible. All the animals, except for one, <laughs> perhaps not all, but at least from all these domesticated animals, one is not mentioned, which is interesting enough. Two of them are sleeping right next to me now. Uh, cats are not mentioned at all, and yeah, they're very interesting animals. And so on, and then dogs, of course, dogs well known as the best best friends to humans. Then you've got other, you know, other animals mentioned, and so on. And uh, there is a reason for that. There is a great reason for that. You know, you know when the animals feel when somebody's sad, they come to comfort humans. I, I've seen various various uh, video recordings of that. They come to comfort. They, they they talk about the cats. They they say that the cats feel where the negative fields are, and they, they just come to, uh, you know, extract all the negative energy out of out of human organ and stuff. One of my cousins, just to uh, <laughs> just to make you laugh a little bit, he used to have a cat for his stomach ache. You know, every time he got a stomach ache, he would just take his cat and put put his cat on the stomach and the stomach would stop hurting <laughs> because he read somewhere that there is some kind of uh, quality in cats like that properties of cats are just amazing you know and so uh, we don't have all that in the bible all that i'm telling you now about the cats we don't have it in the bible but we do know from our experience and we do know from other literature that that's 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 what it is but the Bible tells us how to treat those animals, you know. The Bible tells us that the righteous man, it's somewhere in the Proverbs, the righteous man treats his animals also righteously, you know. So treating animals in a correct way, treating the animals the right way, is actually part of righteousness, which means that people who do not do that, they're unrighteous, which means exactly what I told you. In the hope of Israel, we are not going to tolerate abuse of animals, nowhere and in the hope of israel we are not going to tolerate of course witchcraft and any of those horrible things but we're not going to tolerate abuse of animals because those who abuse the animals will face the judgment of god and if they happen to be in our midst before judgment of god they're going to face the judgment my judgment and hopefully you know my judgment because i'm here to apply the the the, the principles of god's law and I'm not going to be associated with, with uh, animal abusers. That's one of the most despicable and disgusting things that you can find. And I'm just about, just for you who live in the United States, I've learned from one of my friends about the veal industry. This does not 
apply to the rest of the world, but it, in principle it does. The veal industry, how the little veals, how the little calves are being are being treated before they go to be slaughtered and served and served on the plates in various restaurants and public places in America. I'm disgusted. I'm disgusted to see little calves being chained to dog dog houses and all kinds of ad abuse I've learned about. And that really boils my blood. You know, which is, just to let you know, I'm on the verge and I'm prepared to make an administrative decision. I cannot forbid eating a wheel because that now will be go above the law. I cannot forbid that because that's allowed, because wheel is clean and it's not, you know, it's biblically clean. However, brethren, once you know how those little baby calves are treated, then I don't know how in, in, in your right mind and how in your in your peaceful conscience could anyone say, we, regardless of the freedom that we have to eat it, how could ever say, whoa, let's order, order, let's order veal, when you have in mind how that poor veal was treated before it came to be on your plate. And because, you know, my conscience is bothered by this, I'm going to recommend... I was, I'm on the verge of making a recommendation for the U.S. membership not to eat veal and not to pay with your, your hard-earned money, pay for the abuse of those poor animals. Because you don't have to. There's plenty of other choices, especially in the United States, so you can eat whatever. But I mean, you know, to uh, to allow yourself to allow yourself to be blind, turn blind eye, eye, and and use your money and uh, and, and and support an industry which the, which 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 abuses animals in that way. To me, it's equally sin, brethren. It's equally sin. What else could it be but sin? Because those poor little calves, they do have nefesh, the soul. They're the living souls as well. And yes, again, there is no biblical, yes, don't get me wrong, I understand. There is no biblical instruction saying you shall not wheel, eat real. No, I'm not saying, that's why I'm saying I'm going to make administrative recommendation, not biblical, because it's not based on, it's not based on, on the me clean and unclean meat, but it will be based on my conscience and your conscience. Because I don't think God will just favorably look at us, in the judgment day, and say, "Oh, yeah, it's a veal. Oh, did you? Oh, did you know how those little calves were were treated? Oh, yes, God, we knew, but we were free. Well, you know, perhaps that's why God. That's why the apostle Paul said in the Bible, "Everything is free to me, but not everything is beneficial." You know, I'm free. Yes, brethren, are you free? Yes, you're free. You're free to do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You know, but is that beneficial? So you're free not only to eat little you know, veals, even if if it was even if the baby cows are maltreated, but you're free to do whatever. You can just go and you know you can just fornicate, you can just do adultery, you can just lie and steal and and, and, and do witchcraft and you know and go and desire uh, property of other people in you know, all that you want. Are you free to do that? Yeah. Who is going to stop you? Am I going to stop you? No, I'm not. I cannot. But brethren, not everything is beneficial. So, you know, people's people's reasoning, when they go for the Feast of Tabernacles, they think, oh, well, you know, eat whatever you, weigh, whatever you want. Yes, I agree. It's in the Bible. Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> but if we know that certain kind of animals are abused in a terrible way, and we still kind of enjoy their meat, you know, it's, you know isn't that a little bit yucky? Isn't that a little bit hypocritical? Isn't that... Isn't that violating the moral principles of the Bible? You see, that's the way we have to think, brethren. We have to think how to apply the moral principles of the Bible in all aspects of our lives, you know. <laughs> that's what it is all about. It has nothing to do with clean or unclean meat in this particular case. You know, it has to do with a principle, ethical principle. We produced a, a booklet called Ethical Treatment of Animals. Well, it's not a booklet. It's part of the our agricultural practices, uh, agricultural principles of, uh, of, of biblical agriculture. And we have a whole chapter saying Ethical Treatment of Animals. So it's part of Ethical Treatment of Animals. It's part of our teaching. It's part of God's law. And if we know that certain animals are unethically treated, you know, would you, would you just be... 
would you just be fine with your conscience to 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 to, to just and indulge yourself in 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 consuming meat that was treated that way i i wouldn't i wouldn't and because god has given certain principles on ethical treatment of animals i certainly am somewhere close i'm getting closer and closer to make a, a formal recommendation formal recommendation of the hope of israel worldwide church of god in u.s not to eat veal because there's plenty of plenty of abundant evidence how those poor baby calves are treated you know and no human reasoning can convince me that that's that's fine just like earlier uh was it well now it's the last year i made an administrative de decision and recommendation that our that our membership should not go to circuses brethren because what is done in circuses is nothing else than abuse of animals do all those lions and, and 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 wild animals do they do it you know by nature do they just go and jump through 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 the fire and all those things of course they don't so somebody has forced them or is forcing them by force to do those things and that's disgusting to me that's abuse of animals and if you think that god is looking favorably on circuses i would just challenge you that he's not and tell me why should you pay money to take your children to look at the abuse of animals if you really love animals well hey there are plenty of opportunities that you can do good for animals and treat you know even to the wild animals you know, wild birds. You can always leave them feeders. People have got, come up with feeders, and 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 and, and, and you know, England is leading there, as far as I know. England is a leading. You know, they came up with feeders. Every house there, uh, squirrels are all over the place. Even the foxes in England. For those of you who don't know, even the foxes in England have become almost domesticated animals. Because in the suburbs of London, I've seen it with my own eyes. In the suburbs of London, they just come close to humans because, you know, humans have got all these waste and stuff. And one of my friends, I still remember, he was he was feeding the small the small baby foxes he was feeding them with chicken bones. So even the wild animal became domesticated because humans were treating them right. So you cannot tell me, you cannot convince me, you cannot convince me that all those animals in circuses are doing things because oh they're just uh, no they're not brethren they are they are they're they're just abused and again if you love animals and you should because in a sense it's a commandment of god and you find it where you find it in the torah in the law in the law of the bible there are several references to animals and how to treat animals uh, donkeys mentioned in particular and 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 usually it's cattle it's cows or or donkeys but it doesn't matter it the whole principle applies to all animal life so my decision was you know don't waste your money watching abuse of animals why don't you use that money to buy some you know buy a feeder or buy something else that the wild animals would enjoy or you know why don't you keep your own animals? I'm sick and tired of the of the of the. I'm sick in this disgusting, sick world. I'm sick with, with all kinds of superstitions about animals, especially about cats. Oh, cats! <laughs> horrible creatures, cats. They're not horrible at all. They're beautiful creatures, and they also kill all the things that are just harmful to us: mice and rats, and even snakes. So, brethren, you see, uh, when we talk about when we talk about Christian life, Christian life is not just we go to Sabbath, you know, for a social gathering and stuff. No, Christian life is that we just have to battle with our, we have to fight with our, with our stupid superstitions. We have to fight about all of the ideas, preconceived ideas that we have. We have to change from within. We have to change in our character, in our hearts, brethren. And those of you who do not understand that will turn to Isaiah in your free time 11 and read there. In the holy mountain of the Lord, all creation will be at peace. And look how the creation will be at peace. Wolf and lion, bear and, 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 and cow, and even the dangerous snake will be, will be absolutely harmless. A little child would be able to play with a snake. Could you imagine a world like that today? Of course not. 
what does that tell you? What that tells you, brethren, that that the, the, the world, from the very moment that the first humans tasted from the forbidden tree, everything got messed up, even in the animal kingdom. But God, God pictures the kingdom of God at total peace even among the animals. They will not be killing one another. There will be no food chain anymore as we know it as today. So please don't, don't try to convince me that all kinds of abuses and, and, and stupidities that people do with animals only just to, you know, for, for, for gain. Just try not to convince me that it's normal. What people do in Spain with Corrida and what they do in Spain with, 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 with bulls and, and various other animals is absolutely horrifying, disgusting. And if the Catholic Church, because most of Spaniards are Catholic, if the Catholic Church is not going to tell them that that's, that's sinful, well, I am going to tell them it's sinful. The Church of God is going to tell them it's sinful. It's unacceptable for Christians to behave that way. Anyway, we're speaking about death. And so many, you may wonder, what does that have to do with that? Well, so many, so many animals have died over the decades because of humans and human misconduct. Brethren, how many extinct species are there? And the Bible says that there is coming a time of restoration of all things. Well, think about it for a moment. If it's restoration, what is going to be restored in the, in the natural life? Well, all of those extinct species will have to be restored, you know. But why have they become extinct? Well, because of human misconduct, because of human sin. And do you think that God is looking upon that favorably? Of course not. Because if he did, then the kingdom of God would not be pictured the way it is in the Bible. So it's time for us, or for some of us, or for many of us, however many of you are, is to stop reasoning like, like, like dummies about everything, including animals. Oh, animals. Who cares about animals? They're just animals. No, they're not animals. They're God's creation. They're not just animals that we can just, you know, be abusing all over the place. Oh, but we'll look so strange to... So what? We will look so strange to our neighbors. So what? Because we don't abuse animals, fine. Let us look so strange. We are no longer part of our neighbors. We are no longer part of our nations. We are spiritually, spirit-led Israelites. We must not look like our neighbors. Because then something is wrong with us. That means that we haven't changed from inside. That means that we don't listen to the God of Israel. And that means that we do not understand the nature of the kingdom of God which we are going to inherit. Brethren, that is how, how we should be thinking. We shouldn't be still, you know, being like dummies, oh, being afraid. We'll not look like our neighbors. Who cares? Did God call us or did he call our neighbors? He called us. Yes, ambassadors for Jesus Christ, the Savior of all mankind, one of the old ambassador song. Well, I'm asking you, are you ambassadors of Christ? In behavior, not in your words. In behavior. Are you the ambassadors of Christ or are you, what is an ambassador? He represents a foreign country. We have become foreigners to all of our neighbors and friends and relatives. Yes, of course we have. Why have we? Well, because we follow. We are, we are, we are, we are members of a different country now. And the laws of that different country, kingdom of God, tells us that the animals are God's creation. And it tells us that we must not abuse those animals. And it tells us that in the kingdom, when the wonderful law of God will be restored over all the earth, all the animals will live at peace. And yet... What do we see in the world around us? Oh, animals, you know. Some of the customs of the nations is horrendous. In some nations they eat dogs. Are you afraid? Are you shocked? 
In other nations, they eat cats and dogs at the same time. In some nations, they eat rats. You know, horrible. Ugh. It's horrible, but that's what people do, brethren. It's amazing what their, their own pleasures or whatever people will be doing. And you may never think that it has to do something with spirituality. Well, it has. It has to do with spirituality. Because we have to give them a different example. Yes, we'll be maligned, we'll be laughed at, we'll be ridiculed. I know, but who cares? Do you care about your good standing with God? Or do you care about your good standing with your unconverted sinful neighbors? And friends and relatives, etc. We're to be the kings tomorrow. Do you realize we'll be kings over all in the kingdom? Full of all those animals will be kings and priests, even over those animals in the sense of taking care of them and, and enjoying their living and restoring all the extinct species. So please, friends, please stop being dumb when it comes to animals. Because I've seen too much dumbness and stupidity and people reasoning when it comes to animals. Oh, animals, oh, animals, you know, who cares, animals, animals, why are, they, why are they important? Well, they are important. To God, they are. And if they're important to God, then they have to be important to all Christians. And enough of these stupidity and childish, childish reasonings, you know. I've been discussed with my friend in China. I've been discussing now for, for, for third week. We've been discussing some of our past experiences with various people we know, we don't know. It's tragic. So much immaturity, childishness. Well, yes, we're to be like little children. Little children is when it comes to, to evil. We're not to be, you know, we're to be totally innocent about doing anything evil. But we're not to be like little small children behaving like, like dummies. Like Teletubbies, you know. Teletubbies, you know, that, that, that stupid cartoon for, for supposedly for children. Oh, my. Brethren, enough. Enough of this worldly influence. Enough of allowing the world to rule us. Enough of our fear that we will be isolated. And Yes, one day we will be isolated. What in the world are you going to do when your national news press in the headlines you appear as the enemies of your countries, enemies of your state, enemies of whatever? And you will. It's prophesied in a sense in the Bible. Did you know that? Oh, you would reason, well, but who cares that we, well, you know who cares? Your intelligence of our nations do care. Why? Because we're different. We're foreigners now. We represent a foreign country. We represent the kingdom of God. And you may wonder, why, why am I raising my voice when I speak about Well, I'm raising my voice trying to pound to you, to underline to you certain things that perhaps, brethren, you do not grasp fully or you just refuse to grasp fully because they look to you preponderous or they look, those things look to you totally strange. Why would somebody be, well, why would, why would they? Well, because, because you're Christians. And because Christ says in his world that uh, you will be hated from, by all nations for my name's sake. Oh, you see. Hated by all nations for my name's sake. That's what it says. And when it says like that, then it, he means that. You know, the word of God is not, you know, a bunch of baloney statements that, oh, they're just so preposterous, preponderous. Oh, do they really, does God really mean? Yes, he does mean. Oh, does Jesus really mean when he said uh, the worst thing ever, like great tribulation is coming? Yes, he means it, yes. So we better start believing that, brethren. We better start praying to God to give us the gift of faith. You know, one thing that my friend said to me indeed uh, was, you know, there's that that statement from Jesus. Will he find faith on the earth when he comes? Yeah, it's a very relevant question. Will he find faith? When you look sometimes how carnal, childish dummies we are, ignoramus is in spiritual sense, you really have to wonder, really, what is Christ going to find when he comes? Well, he may find everything other than faith. What about instruction to live by faith and not by sight? What about that? Oh, it's certainly going to be very relevant before he comes, that we have to live by faith and not by sight, you know? 
I'm my point, brethren, is to just yeah, I'm talking about death, but before death comes to you, before death comes to claim your life, before you go to sleep, I'm just trying to ask you, what is your life about? I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to motivate you to to, to focus on your life, how you live, who you are, what is your identity. Who you serve? Do you serve the God of this world and this world and its passions? Or do you serve God of Israel who is a totally foreign God to this world? But yes, foreign is his, so foreign should be, should be us. And we have to endure to the end. Because only then we shall be in the future saved. We talked about that in Message of Salvation. But you see, we have been so much, so much influenced by all these Protestant ideas, primarily, and various other things we grew up with, and our cultural uh, matrices, and, uh, uh, and 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 various ideas that are put in our mind by our education system, and so on, that we just sometimes we just find it hard to let go of it. Well, let go of it, brethren, because it doesn't lead to life eternal. Because all those things that they taught us, they look good to a man. They look right to a man. But the end of that is death, it says in Proverbs. Only the Bible and what is written in the Bible is the foundation of true knowledge. Can we understand that? And can we start taking that as something wonderful, something great, something that liberates us? You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's a prophecy. Do you want to be free? Well, then you have to practice the truth that you are learning. And this church is supposed to give you the truth so that you can be living righteous, holy lives. And by doing so, building yourself, allowing God to build in you righteous, holy, uh, perfect, uh, 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 permanent character without which none of us will enter into the kingdom of God. None of us. Mr. Armstrong used to say it in all of his almost in all of his in all of his major works. Unlike incredible human potential. But I just wonder what happens? What do people think when they read those words? Don't they stop to think, wait a second, am I living a holy righteous life? Am I allowing God to build in me holy righteous character? Oh, am I just, or am I just afraid? Oh, oh, I'll be so different than my nation, than my ethnicity, than my tribe, than my, you know, you name it. Brethren, stop being so afraid. Perfect love casts out all fear. Stop being afraid. You should be afraid of losing on your salvation. You should be afraid of not living righteous character. You should be afraid of abusing God's creation. You should be afraid of being spiritual dummies. That's what you should be afraid. Not about not pleasing this world. Doesn't the Apostle James say whoever is the friend of the world is the enemy of God? Of course he didn't mean in the enemy in, you know, you probably know what he meant. I, I, I presume you do understand what he meant. So while you still have life, you know, please, 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 try to think about spending the rest of your, rest of your life living dignified as true Christians, not the spiritual dummies. So we read in Genesis 2 and verse 7 that men... Man became a living soul. So if you notice that, well, that means that man does not have a soul. He is a soul. So the man, he doesn't say the man got a living uh, soul and then he now possesses it. So no, no, no. The very man is a soul. And the word translated soul here, I will mention it, is in Hebrew, is the word nefesh. It means a living, breathing, physical creature. Just like all the animals are what? Living, breathing, physical creatures, are they? Yes, they are. And the word comes, carries no implication of immortality. In Genesis 1, verse 24, nefesh is translated living creature and refers to, oh, what a surprise. Refers to who? To animals. So if they're a living creature, can they feel pain? Certainly. Can they 
suffer? Yes. Can they be offended by humans? Sure. And are they, as living creatures, precious to God? Yes, most certainly. Also, dogmatically, the scripture tells us that the soul can die. And if the soul can die, therefore it cannot be immortal. You have in Ezekiel, uh, in one chapter, chapter 18, you have got in two, in two verses, you have the warning that the soul that sins, the same shall die. Let's go and see it. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. And if you are not taking notes, I'm rebuking all of you who are not taking notes. I'm rebuking you now because, you know, you cannot remember everything by, by, by mind. We are just bombarded by, by, by all kinds of information. You cannot really memorize it. It's very difficult. So please start taking notes because it will help you to uh, concentrate. It will help you to focus. And it's time for us, brethren, to finally understand that taking notes is not something something unworthy. And that pen and paper have not been invented because they're useless, but because they're very, 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 very useful. So Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine, says God. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. Now when you read that, it looks like, oh, the soul of the Father. So all those people have the souls and they're, no, 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 no. All those people are souls and all souls, all the people are mine, says God. The soul who sin, sins shall die. And also in verse 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. In other words, you cannot be fellowshipping. That's another point. You can be in the right fellowship all along. You can be in the right church all along. But if you have no own your righteousness, if you do not build your righteousness and your righteous, permanent, wonderful uh, relationship with God, nothing can save you, brethren. The righteousness of others are not going to save you. They are not going to do any good anyway. We all have to build personal relationship with Jesus Christ and with God. And I've been always, this is why the church of God is there to teach you to build your personal relationship with God. And with Jesus Christ. Because that is what is going to build the holy, righteous, perfect character in you. And without that, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And also, that the soul can die, that the man can die. In other words, you read, we read in Ezekiel, let's read in Matthew 10. So write down Matthew 10, you who are taking notes, Matthew 10, verse 28. All right, I'm I, I, sorry that I, I, I sound like, I sound like, I don't know, but I sound like that because people never understand, some people never understand the value of taking notes. They come to the church, they sit down, they sit through a sermon, they sit through a message. Yes, they be inspired by the message, but then when you ask them at the end, all right, um, uh, where do you find, where do you find that the soul is mortal? Well, they don't know because they didn't take notes. Matthew 10, verse 28. It should be the words of Jesus. Yes, Jesus Christ speaks now the fear of God. What I said a minute ago. What I said, are you going to be afraid of your surroundings not doing this or, or laughing at you because you don't abuse animals, for example? Yes, I know. Don't You don't have to tell me, brethren. I grew up in a gentle society. I know how the gentle society works. And most of you grew up in gentle societies. And you don't have to convince me. I know how it works. I know how it works. I've been a victim of that society myself. I've had to endure all kinds of horrible things from that society. Yes, brethren, I know that. So do you. Yes, I know. Is Jesus Christ going to deliver us from those societies? Yes, he will. Of course he will.
Matthew 10, 27, whatever I tell you, in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the in the ear, preach on the housetops. Verse 28, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul, he says here in uh, uh, New King James, in hell, but it means in grave, in death. So be afraid of him, fear God, and do not be, you know, do not be, do not be anything else. Uh, next time when somebody comes up, please, every time you come up into the call, make sure that you mute yourselves, my dear friends, because otherwise, otherwise, otherwise you'll be coughing in the microphone, sneezing in the microphone, talking in the microphone, and it's not going to help the uh, focus and concentration of those who will be listening to these messages later. Anyway. So, we better fear God. To whom God will look, it says in Micah, to, to the one who trembles at his word. At his word, and his word, every his word is God-breathed in the Bible. It's, 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 it leads us to righteousness. So don't, don't give me this, 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 this stupidities and, 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 and dumb things about, oh, animals. Why should you care about the animals? Well, you should care about the animals because Adam, Adam was taking care of all the Garden of Eden, of all the animals, of all those living souls, of all those creatures. And I'm not going to tolerate any such dumb and unbiblical and ungodly reasoning. Oh, why should we care? Yes, we should. Because it's our duty. Because we're Christians, if we are. So the Bible nowhere teaches that man has an immortal soul. In fact, the immortal soul doctrine was adopted by professing Christianity from pagan Egypt through the Greek philosophers. Many of our things that we have today in around us that we can see comes from Egypt, brethren. From Egypt... And then those ideas were adopted by the Greeks, Greek philosophers in particular, Plato and Aristotle and the rest. And then we know those ideas permeated in Roman philosophy and Roman theological systems. And then from Rome, it just spread all over the world. Oh, what a, what a surprise, right? And the Bible has its name. It's called, the name for that is called Babylon. Bible calls it spiritual Babylon because all of those things before Egypt originated in Babylon with the original re rebellious person against God called Nimrod who is actually the founder of worldwide Satanism friends and I would encourage you well you know in, in English language at least I understand in our various local dialects and languages we don't have that blessing, but in the English language at least, which you all understand, there are still books there. One of them called The Two Babylons by Hislop. Or Babylon Mystery Religion. Friends, we can find them on internet, download them on internet, and if you don't have it, just ask for it. I'll send it to you. I've made a whole little library of those books because they're they're useful. They're not the Bible, but they explain to us what is written in the Bible. They explain to us the background of certain personalities and certain events and certain developments. So the Bible nowhere teaches the man has an immortal soul that was in Egypt, came to Greece, from Greek Greeks people that came to Rome, from Rome came all over the place, just like everything else. Just like your Easter, Christmas and everything else. It came all from Rome. Oh, how come? Well, how come? Well, for the first, supposedly, first Roman Christian Emperor Constantine the Great. One of the greatest re rebels against God. God willing, I'll finish the, the, the book, the booklet on him in Serbian, and then we can just, we'll just have it translated into, I want it to be translated into as many languages as possible, because I'm also sick and tired of this, of this ignorance, friends, ignorance. You need to know how come we got this today, this normal Christianity. You may wonder, where did we get it from? No, we, well, we got it from Constantine, who just enforced it upon the world. So what you have in the world, we have you have a violent, you had the violent 
subversion of the true day of rest, of the Sabbath. You had the violent subversion of God's uh, true Passover. And all these things that this Christianity today believes, it's all violence, brethren, violence. Violence against God, it was all imposed on the world by violence, by violent men like Nimrod, like Constantine the Great. But it's important to know. It's important to understand, yes. Because if you don't want to follow God, then you'll follow the Constantine's religion. <laughs> right, right. Then you follow the religion of apostates. You see, that's why it is so important to understand. So that you can say, well, wait a second, this man was an apostate. Am I supposed to follow his teachings? No. Is it no? No. Well, it's no. Fine. I don't want to, I'm not going to follow his teachings. And that's it. That's part of our conversion, brethren. But we also noted, speaking now of death and, 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 and humans, as God stated, that man is composed of the physical elements of the earth and is dust. So God says in Genesis 3 verse 19, plainly told Adam who sinned, he says, for dust you are and to dust you shall return. But brethren, men do not want to die, you see. So they do not want to believe God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When they don't want something, they don't want to believe God. And if God said, if God possibly said in the Bible, please humans keep Sunday as the holiday rest. Please humans go and do fornication and adultery and lie and steal and all that. The rebellious humans will probably do all everything opposite, you see. <laughs> That's the human nature, isn't it? The humans will do everything opposite than that. But no, they're just, you know, doing all the opposite things that God said. And uh, here we are today. It all started in the Garden of Eden, brethren. It all started in the Garden of Eden with the rebellion of first humans. And it just continues to this day. And every time you may think, where did something start? Well, they started most likely from the Garden of Eden. And all this mayhem and this mess and this, 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 this horror and currently all these wars now. Oh, the, another one started last night, was it yesterday? U.S. and U.K. Uh, bombed the, the, the Houthi, Houthi positions in Yemen. Oh, my. Of course they did because the international trade through the Red Sea, about 30% of the international trade is being carried through the Red Sea. But as soon as they bombed the Houthi, all of a sudden there comes. There comes Russia, Iran, and the rest. Oh, it's a violation of the international law. Oh, really? Oh, brother, there's violation of international law all over the place, and nobody cares. And then funny story, this is just a side comment. Before the international tribunal in Hague, South Africa brings Israel to the... <laughs> to, could you believe that? To accuse Israel of, 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 of genocide. No, I'm not going to, of course, I'm not going to be justifying the state of Israel. I'm just saying the hypocrisy, brethren. The hypocrisy. In that very South Africa, there was apartheid. Apartheid like nowhere in the world for, for years in the last century, for years, for decades. And then apartheid was finally demolished. But then it came some, there came another genocide. The persecution of all the white people and white farmers. Ex, uh, expro expropriation of their of their farms and all kinds of things and here comes now the black South Africa accusing Israel of, of genocide meanwhile meanwhile there was a genocide committed you know on their souls soil it's, it's it's ludicrous it's a disgusting world in which we live brethren is the world in which we are going to make you know Peace and order when Jesus Christ comes. In the meantime, we just, you know, suffer along with this world, you know, one way or the other. You may wonder, well, 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 well what would you suffer? Well, we suffer, of course, because as a, as a result of the war in Ukraine, and don't ask me to analyze that because I've done it. And I've told you one thing, friends, from the very first, from the very first, first, uh, gun that that, that 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 shot 
in that part of the world. I told you, friends, it's not going to end well, not for Russia, but for Ukraine. Because I told you that from the very first day of that war, I said, friends, it's impossible to defeat Russians, not because there's something special, but because their mentality I know. It's, it's mentality that, 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 that does not accept defeat. And I told you, I told you, I've been telling you for months, no matter what, how much aid Ukraine will get, you see nothing works for Ukraine. Counteroffensive, spring counteroffensive failed. Russians have now fortified their, their, their lines and retook all the, they have retaken all the, all the territories that they've lost to the Ukrainians. And all of that, brethren. And I told you there's no way to defeat Russians. They're just, they're just that kind of people. And I know not many people will love to hear that, but whether you like it or not, that's the truth. And that truth is being proven on the ground. One of your favorite expressions for our people in Africa. I love that one. The situation on the ground, when they say. <laughs> yes, indeed. The situation on the ground, yes. The situation on the ground constantly keeps telling us that all those counteroffensive and aid and all of this rubbish is nothing. You cannot defeat. To defeat Russians, you'll have to kill them all to the last one because they will not accept defeat. And it's impossible to kill them all to the last one because they're just skillful. I mean, they live on minus 50 below zero. Do you hear me, people? To you, some of you people in Africa, 15 degrees Celsius is already like in Kenya. People are just feeling cold. Imagine living on 50, 50 below zero. And they just function. So it's that kind of tough mentality that you cannot really conquer, not in this world. But you may wonder, what do I have to? Well, I have to because all the prices have skyrocketed. The gas, we depend on gas because of Russia and Ukraine. Both countries are exporters of gas. Africa, Africa depends on them for maize. And you know, we all suffer as a result of that. As a result of that, right there in Malawi, in Mozambique, I hear there's already a, a kind of hunger. Well, several months ago, didn't I, didn't I mention to you, several months ago, that this was a fear that there will be there will be there will be hunger in Africa because of because of the war in Ukraine. I, I I think I told you that. In fact, why 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 the bunch of African leaders went to visit Putin, Russia, and Putin told them, "Don't worry, I'll send you the maize free." You see, we all suffer as a result of this stupid world and its stupid conflicts. You know, and all war, every war is a result of sin, anyway. No matter how much we may think that one side is more righteous than the other, well, no, really. And I'm hoping, as I say, that I'm hoping you don't believe your mainstream media because your mainstream medias are usually full of propaganda. And don't tell me there is a free world. I'm just, you know, free. What free world? If the world was so free, and if there were free countries, then this was happening to Donald Trump in America would be outrageous. It's an open sabotage of freedom, freedom of, of voting, freedom of, of, of speech, freedom of everything. There's no more freedom, friends. And doesn't, doesn't, the, doesn't not the apostle, but the King David, doesn't he say in one psalm, I'm counting like a sheep for slaughter. They kill me every day. I'm counted as a sheep for slaughter. Well, yes, indeed. That's how we, be count we should be counting ourselves. So anyway, men do not want to die, so they do not want to believe God. When God says, for dust you have become, you know, or for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And the men don't want to believe that man's life is merely a physiochemical existence that will run down and stop and die. And hence, they choose instead to believe that that lie that Satan told E when he said, you'll surely not die. That lie is in Genesis 3 and, and verse 4. Brethren, they believe that, with, that within this dusty body that we all have, 
that within this dusty body as a sort of prisoner of the flesh is an immortal soul that is unleashed at the death of the body and that continues in conscious life forever. That's what humans believe. Because it horrifies them, you know, to even think that, yeah, human body stops, dies, and perishes in the ground. But to be sure, brethren, man is not merely an animal, you see. For one, man is made in God's image and in God's likeness, as we know from Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. And to those of you who may think that God is, I don't know, some kind of Unitarian, it says, let us make man in our image, in plural. But people cannot grasp that it's Elohim family. It's a plurality of unison. It's, uh, you know, in any family, you have one, one family, which is comprised of various number of members. N neither family has got only one member. Every family in the world has got more than one member. So we have this family Elohim, family God. So if it says in our image, in our likeness, then it's in our. But people refuse to believe that, so they've come up with this triune God and all these stupid things, you know. They have nothing to do with the Bible. And man's potential, brethren, so not only are we in God's likeness, but potential of each human, that is that, that of being born into the God family, family Elohim, is far more incredible than the fate of any animal, which again does not give to any of you or to me right to abuse the animal. We have greater potential, but that potential depends on the way, how we live our lives and how we also treat animals. And God further reveals that there is a spirit in a man that gives men mental superiority over animals. That's true. And no science has discovered that. No religion believes that. No church preaches that. But the Apostle Paul preaches that. So please go to 1 Corinthians 2.11 and please drop down and make notes of 1 Corinthians 2.11. Brethren, start, start you adults Start learning from your children and start learning being like children. You're in school, and we are we you know we are being spiritually spiritually dumbed by the stupid societies around us and all the preconceived ideas we grew up with, and therefore therefore we need to behave like a school because we have to unlearn wrong things that we have learned. In First Corinthians chapter two and in verse eleven. Paul says, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So, the spirit of the man which is in him. Friends, we have all that spirit. That's what gives us what we call mind. And that is why we are superior over animals because we can, you know, that's the spirit that uh, unifies with God's spirit at, 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 at baptism. Through that spirit, we have this communion, if you wish, with God. We will build that relationship with God. As I told you, God is always interested in our spiritual things. He doesn't care whether we are light, nice, whether we have brown eyes and blue eyes and long hair, short hair, whether we're bold or not, whether, you know, God doesn't care about physical. He cares about spiritual, you see. That's why we have to allow God through His Spirit to work in us, to build in us spiritually holy, righteous, permanent character without which we will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it is this Spirit that imparts the power of mind to man and the power of moral decision and the power of moral ethical treatment of animals, including the ability to grow in character. You see, that's brethren, what is the key. We have to start understanding finally the Church of God and being part of the Church of God is not only about the doctrines, it is about the doctrines, but that those doctrines should lead us to what? To growth of character, brethren. Doctrines by themselves, knowledge by itself, is useless. But love edifies, says the Apostle Paul. So the love for God's doctrines, the love for what God teaches us, should lead us to character, that we grow in character. But you see, this spirit in man, it is not the man, and it is not an immortal soul. It is something that man... Uh, in man that gives man a dimension of life above the animals. He does not give him immortal life, however. 
So to understand death requires that we know that man's life is merely a chemical process involving physical elements. When the process stops, we die. We are dust, and when we die, our bodies decay and return to dust. When we die, all conscious thought and awareness ceases. If you notice Psalm 6.5, I made allusions to these scriptures in some past messages, but here they are. Notify, notice them and write them down, friends. Those of you who still have not, not, not have this custom to write down and take notes, you better change your custom quickly. Because this is the school and you cannot hold everything in your in your head and you cannot memorize it all by hearing. Some of you perhaps may or could, can, being smart as you are, but uh, many of you cannot. Psalm 6.5 For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave who will give you thanks? The apostle, not the apostle, but King, uh, King David telling God. If you compare that to Ecclesiastes 9, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 4 and 5. For him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead dog, than a dead lion. <laughs> living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. No, nothing because they are asleep. So the Apostle Paul also knew that even the righteous die and lose consciousness and bodily presence because he says in Acts chapter 2, verse 29, Acts 2, 29, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, uh, and his tomb is with us to this day. Verse 34, For David did not ascend into the heavens. And we recently produced a booklet in which we explained that nobody ascends to heaven. Nobody has ever booklet on Enoch and Elijah. Because of misunderstanding of the terminology in the Bible, the Protestants and others think that they, these two were ascending to heaven. Brethren, just, j j j just one, one comment on that. If Enoch before Jesus Christ and Elijah before Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, then who is our Savior? Jesus Christ or Enoch and Elijah? You see, Jesus Christ had to be the firstborn among many brethren. He had to be the first one to ascend to heaven back to Father's throne. But then he had to be. Otherwise, he is not our Savior. But if we know that he is our Savior, and if we know that he is the one, then how can we be believing that Enoch and Elijah before Jesus Christ ascended to heaven. Again, all the beliefs of this nominal Christianity, if you think about it, just just, just violates violates the, the common sense, friends. And it's incredibly we some of us were in those in those yeah, I was not, but many of you were. When you think about this violation of common sense, so who are those people? What are the spiritual dummies? Who were you then before God revealed all these things to you? You were spiritual dummies. But yeah, I understand people are spiritual dummies. But, you know, when you tell them, show them, reveal to them all these things, like the Church of God will, all be, will, will be always doing, well then, brethren, I expect you at least to turn the mind that God has given you to switch on your mind and, and connect the dots. So Jesus Christ had to be the first because he's our Savior. Then how can you believe at the same time that Enoch and Elijah actually went before Christ to heaven? doesn't make any sense doesn't make any sense because then Enoch and Elijah are saviors and not Jesus Christ, you see. But you see, we just take things for granted. We sometimes don't even think about things. We, we, we Ever since we were little, we just took for granted all that we were learning from our religious surroundings. And we were just spiritual dummies. Now God has revealed, opened up our minds to reveal His truth to us. And it's time that we just... All this knowledge and, 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 and ignorance, all this lack of true knowledge and all this ignorance is to be 
ignored. He's to be kicked out. He's to be overcome, if you want. We have to overcome it. It's part of overcoming. Part of overcoming is all this wrong knowledge that has no foundation in the Holy Scriptures. So even righteous David was not an immortal soul that left his body and went to heaven. And even David was dust and decayed back to the elements. Now other scriptures surely they supply even more detail upon death, comparing it in a figure of speech to sleep. Uh, here is well here are two examples. First Corinthians eleven thirty. For this reason many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. Now this is in context of keeping the Passover. The Corinthian church were keeping the Passover like the like the common worldly feast, you know. Which means that they did not understand the point of the Passover. By the way, I hope to have very soon my booklet on the Passover, New Testament Passover should be ready for your for your reading and before the Passover comes, I would hope that all of our members would read it and just get acquainted with it. Because that's the most solemn occasion in our lives, brethren. And because it's the most solemn occasion that we need to understand all of its elements. From foot washing to consumption of bread and wine. So many were keeping Passover wrongly and then therefore many were asleep. In the That's in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, First Kings... If you would go to First Kings chapter two, First Kings chapter two, and the verse should be ten. First Kings two ten. It says, uh, "So David rested with his fathers, and was buried in the city of David. He rested, you see, or he fell asleep <laughs> with his fathers." So when a person is asleep, he loses consciousness and is unaware of his surroundings. The topic of death, brethren, in some, in some ways is unique because most people will not believe what God says in their senses. Tell them Because, you know, if their senses tell them differently, they will not believe. For example, Adam and Eve did not believe God's warning about the tree of good and evil because the fruit of the tree of evil looked to them good and and desirable. Yet, in the case of death, you see, people will not believe God when He says death is what it indeed appears to be to the most casual observer, namely the secession of life. People will not believe God no matter what He says, whether our senses tell us to agree or not. <coughs> but caution, you see, nothing said here means to imply that death is the end of all hope of life. No, it is not. If it is, otherwise we wouldn't be calling ourselves hope of Israel, because hope of Israel is hope for all nations. So it's not, you know, it's not the end of all hope of life. It's not an old saying goes in English, where there is a life, there is hope. But God says, in effect, that even where there is death, there is still hope, in fact, the main hope. The main hope, you see, that's another reason why we're called the hope of Israel. If you go to Job 14.14, 14, the book of Job 14.14, 14, that hope, brethren, is the resurrection of the dead from the death to life again. Notice, here's Job's question and answer about death. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of, his, of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. So, brethren, realize this. This demonstrable fact of the resurrection of the dead proves once again and once for all that humans are not immortal souls. If they were, why would, they, why would the dead have to be resurrected? They would always be alive. And see further Christ's startling statement in John 5.25. Here's Christ's startling statement. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of Man, and those who hear will live. 
You see, Jesus knew his statement might startle the audience, of course. So he said even further, if you look at verse, uh, that's John 5, now verse 28 and 29, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming, in which all who are in graves will hear the voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation or the resurrection of judgment. So the scriptures, brethren, are plain that all people will be resurrected, even those who will eventually be cast into the lake of fire to die the second death. The Apostle Paul chose to, com uh, to comfort the living relatives of those true Christians who had died by reminding them of the wonderful resurrection to come. And he does that in his very, very first epistle he wrote. Do you know what is the first epistle the Apostle Paul wrote? You probably don't. Well, the first epistle he wrote is not Romans, it's not Corinthians, it's not Galatians, it's not Colossians. It is, it is Thessalonians, brethren. So in First Thessalonians, the first, the very first uh, epistle that Apostle Paul wrote, we read about the resurrection. First Thessalonians chapter four and verse thirteen. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest your sorrow, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord by no means will precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with, a, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then... We who are alive and remain shall be caught, uh, uh, caught up together with him, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with him. Therefore comfort one another with these words. And yes, we're comforted. You see, that's the hope. That's why we're called the hope of Israel. Every time we say our name, every time we read our name, every time we think about our name, brethren, we have this hope. That no, 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 it's, you know, death is just a temporary condition. Death is not the end of the story. So to alleviate their sorrow, Paul explained that the dead in Christ will be resurrected at Christ's return and that they will forever be with Christ. And yes, the truth about death is far less foreboding than the fanciful imaginations of well-intentioned but errant religionists. Now, if you missed any key verse, and if you're taking notes, let me just repeat some of those verses. When properly understood, this topic of death can fill us with real hope, brethren, for then we know the wonderful truth that we all will see our beloved deceased relatives again, and therefore it may be well to note specifically the basic scriptures and that describe the truth about death. So here are some of them. Man is a mortal being made from a dust, Genesis 2.7 and Genesis 3.19. The Hebrew word soul, translated in Genesis 2.7, is translated as living creature and refers to animals, Genesis 1.24. The soul is not immortal, it dies, Ezekiel 18 verse 4 and verse 20 and Matthew chapter 10 verse 8. The dead have no consciousness, Psalm 6 verse 5 and Ecclesiastes 9 verse 4 and 5. Death is compared to sleep, John 11, verse 11 through 14, and second, and sorry, first king, first kings, chapter 2, verse 10. And the dead will be resurrected, John chapter 5, verse 25, verse 28 to 29, and first Corinthians chapter 15. So friends, in conclusion, Death is indeed an enemy, but through the resurrection from the dead, this enemy is annihilated. Therefore, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 
verse 54. So then this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory?